Hello, everyone, and welcome to this edition of our Site Bite series. Today, we will be talking with Connor Buzain, who successfully manages a dual diagnosis of bipolar disorder and addiction. Connor is a music meister, an expert wordsmith, and has interviewed and written about the Beastie Boys, Green Day, Robert De Niro, Kirsten Dunst, among others, for such outlets as MTV News, AOL, and Vice. Connor has covered major music events like Lollapalooza in Chicago, SXSW in Austin, and the Tribeca Film Festival in New York City. In addition to music, Connor has penned scripts and articles on topics like Columbine and the crisis in Dafar. He's equally comfortable writing about Lady Gaga as he is scribbling pieces on the most obscure rock and punk bands. After an intervention for his alcohol abuse and a stint in rehab in 2012, Connor shifted his attention to writing about mental health and addiction. His first book, The Bipolar Addict, Drinks, Drugs, Delirium, and Why Sober is the New Cool is out now. So welcome, Connor, and thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you so much, Tracy. Glad to be here. I thought we could start by having you tell us a little bit about uh, what it was like growing up before you had any diagnosis and then your journey and how you came to learn um, that you had bipolar disorder. Sure. Okay. Well, I had a, a very innocent childhood. Uh, I grew up in the 80s and uh, I ha actually had a stay-at-home dad, which was very ground groundbreaking for the time. Yes. <laughs> uh, and... Um, yeah, he was the one who baked cookies for us and cleaned the house and everything. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I, the first time I noticed something was off was in first grade. I, um, I had a terrible experience with the teacher who was just extremely mean. And I, my dad would drag me into the school every day, kicking and screaming. And so finally I transferred to a private Catholic school and I thrived in that environment. And um, but I always felt different. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until I got to high school that um, I started to feel accepted. And that's because I discovered punk rock. And um, punk to me was, uh, there's a lyric by a band called Rancid, uh, when, when I got the music, I got a place to go. Yeah. And um, it's very much that. It, Every weekend we would go to $5 punk shows at this place called the Fireside Bowl, which is kind of like the CBGB of Chicago. Um, the place was falling apart and it was a mess. <laughs> but, uh, we, we had so much fun seeing so many punk bands there. And I really felt like I had found my tribe there. Yeah, it's amazing how much music really does bond people over all genres. Absolutely, absolutely. And um, so, I started to feel comfortable. I was comfortable there at the Fireside Bowl, but at school I was still kind of feeling left out or ostracized or just, you know, different. So um, I was happy to leave uh, Chicago and leave all my high school people. And I went to college in Iowa at Iowa State, and that was the perfect place to sort of um, settle down and, and uh, have no distractions and study. And I worked at the college newspaper and the radio station and the magazine. And I was just, I was so busy with everything. And, um, and like everyone, I drank a lot in college. Um, kind of the time for that. <laughs> for yeah. Some people. Yeah. Yeah. I, I binge drank every weekend uh, and some on some weekdays also. So the alcoholism started to emerge even back then. Um, graduated college, or yeah, graduated college, moved to New York for a job at AOL, and uh, I was still drinking a lot. And um, I was working with a lot of 20-somethings, and so we all would just go to the bar after, after work for happy hour. Stay up all night, and that's what you yeah. do when you're 20. Yeah, yeah every day. And um, so, um, when that job ended, I started working at MTV News and interviewing bands and artists and um, covering events. And it was a lot of fun. And 
but when I first started to notice something was really significantly wrong was when I was working on a live television show that we did. This was in 2008 uh, during the campaign. We did a live show. Uh, it was called the Presidential Dialogue with John McCain. And um, we did one for Obama and we did one for Hillary, but this one was the, the McCain one that I was working on. And I just was a nervous wreck. I had an anxiety <laughs> I <can> attack. <laughs> yeah, I, li I mean, live TV is the ultimate stressor. Like it's, it's so, it, you know, because if you make a mistake, there's right. no way of fixing it. It's live. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, I was just pacing around my hotel room before the show and sweaty palms. I couldn't get my palms to stop sweating. And I was just so, I, I just couldn't handle it. And I, I mean, I survived in the end and we did the show and it was fine. But as soon as I got back to New York, I saw, started seeing a psychiatrist mm. and she diagnosed me with uh, depression at first. Right, and we know that's, that's common to have not a full diagnosis or sometimes even a misdiagnosis um, on right. their search. Yeah, so the Prozac brought me out of a depression, but it also caused me to skyrocket. In mania? In mania, yeah. Another really common happening when, when people with bipolar disorder take antidepressants, it often leads to mania. Indeed, uh, and it did, and I was not sleeping. I was staying up all night. Um, I, I was working actually a lot, uh, writing stories for MTV News and um, some of my best stories that I ever have written in life were when I was manic. Yeah, um, yeah. Because when you're manic, you're hyper-focused and you're making sure everything is perfect. And um, so, from there, um, I ended up at a press junket in Philadelphia. Uh, it was a, organized by like the local tourism board or whatever, and they were trying to promote the music scene in Philadelphia. So I went on this press junket and I was completely manic. Wow. And, um, I, you know, they took us around to different music venues to see live music and we got to meet some of the local uh, Philadelphia music industry celebrities, etc. And I would talk their ear off forever. <laughs> I bought a stack of vinyl a foot high. Wow, that's really cool. Yeah. So, um, and when I got back, my boyfriend at the time, uh, we lived together in Dumbo, Brooklyn, and um, I just continued the craziness. I, um, I was blasting my iPod and marching around the apartment with my, with a towel on my head, wow. black music, and I was rearranging furniture. I was rearranging DVDs and books and just all those things that those of us who are bipolar, we know right. we do. We do They're pretty, familiar. Yes, we do uh, wild and crazy uh, things behaviors. when we're manic. And um, so finally he, he, uh, decided that, hey, like, we, I need to take you to the psychiatrist again. Like, this is, this is, something is off, significant yeah. off. So I went with him and uh, the two of us sat there with my psychiatrist and she, she gave me a bipolar diagnosis. Wow. And I know we talked earlier that um, in some respects, when people who have had these experiences throughout, like like you said, starting at a young age, um, finally when they get a diagnosis, it's, it's something at least they can hold on to and it starts to make sense and then they can start to manage. So um, that's, that's great um, in a sense that you were able to get the help. Um, I know that we uh, mentioned that you manage a dual diagnosis of bipolar and addiction. And I was wondering if you had some thoughts about reasons um, that people managing bipolar disorder do reach out to drugs and alcohol sometimes um, for management and share a little bit about your experience and what led you there. Sure. Um, well, I think when you've been manic before, you want to recapture that feeling. Mm -hmm. It's almost like an addiction itself. Um, I mean, because, because being manic, at least, at least in the early part of mania, feels really good. And, and, and lots of people report that there are 
um, benefits, if you will, or, or things that are great about it. So that makes sense. Yeah. And you can be a superhuman and, you know, do all these things and, and you want to recapture that. So you start taking drugs. And for me it, at around that time, it was marijuana. So I was smoking pot like every night. Mm -hmm. And, um, one thing that's different about me is that, um, uppers bring me down and downers bring me up. Uh, so, so the opposite effect that the majority of people have. Yes. Yeah. So um, I would smoke marijuana and it would bring me down and calm me down enough to work on a, a writing a story. Um, but that winter of uh, 2008 was just complete mania from February, March, April. April is finally when I crashed. Wow. Is there um, a, a difference in the desire and reasoning uh, in your thought process to use during episodes of mania versus episodes of depression? And what does that feel like? I don't feel the urge to use or drink when I'm depressed. Um, in fact, I remember one time thinking, oh, well, maybe a glass of wine will help. And so my boyfriend poured me a glass of wine and I took one sip and I, I could feel the depression in my body just from wow. one sip. Wow. Um, um, so I, I realized that, that no recreational drugs, alcohol, anything, any mind altering substance was not good for depression. So then you just uh, went back to it when you're feeling manic to sustain that feeling or um, initiate that feeling. Yes. And even when I'm stable, um, I, I mean, obviously I'm sober. I don't drink or use drugs anymore at all. But when I was, um, when I was still using and drinking, um, if I was stable, I would, uh, and not manic, I would, I would definitely use. Yeah. What was the impetus? Uh, that helped you realize that you um, needed to do something different to embrace both of these conditions, bipolar and addiction, um, and the point where you started to really move toward wellness? Okay, um, well, there was a suicide attempt. Uh, I was hanging out with uh, my boyfriend. This is a different boyfriend, one in Chicago. And um, he uh, was a Republican, and I'm very liberal. And we used to get in shouting matches about mm -hmm. politics. And one night it just got particularly heavy. And, you know, and, and we were drinking and it was 4 a.m. And we were screaming at each other. And I just got so angry. I ran into the bathroom, slammed the door and took a fistful of lithium. Wow. And um, so I ended up in an ambulance going to the hospital. And I stayed in the hospital for two days. I detoxed, um, but I, uh, I felt so lonely in the hospital. I was by myself. I didn't, I didn't want anybody to know what happened. So I didn't tell my parents and I didn't, I didn't tell my sister and I, I didn't tell any of my friends. The only person who knew was, was my boyfriend at the time. And he came to visit, but he, you know, obviously works and couldn't spend all his time with me. And I just remember crying, sometimes sobbing, sometimes hysterically in that hotel room. And I just knew this, I can't continue with this. Yeah, that something has to be different. Um, yeah. Well, let me say, I'm really grateful that you made it through um, that attempt and you're here doing your great work. Um, you talked a little bit about feeling lonely in the hospital and I was wondering if you could um, maybe tell us how you dealt with some of the stigma and other barriers we know that um, mental health stigma is still something that we're working towards eradicating, and it is one of the leading reasons why people um, don't seek treatment. Um, they don't know how to handle um, maybe a new diagnosis or to speak to their family. So um, tell us a little bit how that worked for you and, and how you overcame those things. Sure. Um, I don't believe that I've experienced much stigma in my life. I, I'm lucky in that. I know that I'm lucky in it's probably because I live in a very liberal city of Chicago and, uh, and I, I move around in kind of liberal circles. 
But um, I remember when I was first prescribed Prozac um, back uh, in 2008, and um, I was really reticent about taking it. I didn't, I didn't want to feel a sense of artificial happiness. Yeah. I thought I was, I was just, I was afraid of taking psych meds. And I mean, that, that's a stigma. Um, a lot of people feel that way. Like, oh, if I take these drugs, that means I'm crazy. And, right, or I'm not my authentic self. Right, exactly. So that, that was how that manifested for me. Um, how does your bipolar disorder present today? Today, I mostly experience depression, especially in the winter. I have seasonal affective disorder. Mm -hmm. Is uh, occurs when it gets dark super early, like 5 p.m. And it's cold. I live in Chicago, so it's cold. It's really it's cold some days. <laughs> yeah. So um, just the combination of the cold and the darkness really, you know, puts you in a depressive mood. And I have a light box that I sit in front of for half an hour a day, and it sort of helps, but um, yeah. Um, I'm sorry, what was the question again? I was just talking about how your um, bipolar presents today. Oh, okay. And um, mania, I, I can only think of one instance of mania when, uh, in, in, during the past uh, 12 or so years. And wow. It was, I knew that I was manic. So I, I knew that I needed to restrain myself and not talk a mile a minute and not go shopping. And yeah. I didn't want to seem like a wreck. And so a lot, a lot I have a really great support system. My parents are very support, supportive. And I talked with them on the phone like for hours. <laughs> um, and they calmed me down and that mania lasted about a week. And um, that's the only mania I've experienced since being diagnosed bipolar. That is so great. And I, I love that story and congratulations. Thank you. Um, I think one of our um, hopes and desires here at International Bipolar Foundation is present these stories of people that are living well, because uh, we need to change the narrative in our country of people that live with mental illness, bipolar, and others, and that they are living um, healthy, successful, meaningful lives. So thank you for that. And um, you talked about a little bit about your light box. I was wondering if there's other tools and strategies that you've developed over the years um, that help you maintain mental wellness as well as your sobriety. Absolutely. Um, so music is my greatest coping mechanism. Every night I sit down with my turntable and my vinyl records or Spotify, and I listen to music intently for a couple of hours. And it's almost like a means of meditation for me. My favorite music just, it, it puts me in a good mood. It, it keeps me grounded. It, and, and I mean, that, that's the biggest coping mechanism. And um, I go on a lot of walks. Uh, I live in a very um, cool neighborhood that has like lots of interesting shops and restaurants and, and you know, all of that stuff. So um, there's plenty to spaces to walk around in. Yeah. And, um, and the same music and nature are just my natural therapies. So I'm just for staying happy. Um, is there anything else um, that you'd like to share besides music and walks that you've tried maybe? Um, um, I mean, sometimes I'll have a cup of tea at night, chamomile, uh, herbal tea, yeah. and that'll calm me down a little bit too. Um, I like to sit in the dark and light a candle and listen to classical music. Oh, nice. Um, that's definitely, uh, when, when I'm feeling, when I'm feeling off, that's what I'll do. And sometimes, I, I don't know if you've ever experienced this or any of your viewers have, but um, if I'm in a crowded room with high ceilings and there's a lot of echoing going on, I will sometimes hear like, after I leave that space, 
I will sometimes hear like a babbling noise, like a residual a, energy of yeah, like a, a lingering voices. Like they're not saying anything in particular. It's just the the sound of a crowd and noise. Yeah, and when that happens, it's really scary. And that's that's when I pull out the cra classical music and and light the candle and sit down and try to drown out that noise. It's kind of reset and um, reground a little bit there. Yes. Um, what do you feel like your greatest challenges have been in living with um, this dual diagnosis? You know, um, I'm a writer, obviously, since I wrote a book. Um, <laughs> um, I find that I'm only able to write or work for three or four hours a day. Um, and sometimes they can be very productive three or four hours, but sometimes, you know, I, I wish that I had the energy to do more. I, yeah. I do, um, I do take a nap every day. Uh, I feel that I need it. And, um, sometimes after the nap I can return to work, but most of the time I, Done I for the day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> even with coffee, like it doesn't really help. Well, coffee can be a double-edged sword sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Um, we talked a little bit before um, this broadcast, and we often see um, bipolar manifesting in creative people um, and creative creativity combined with addiction. And I was wondering what you could share with us about some of the famous people um, that we might recognize and uh, that lived with a dual diagnosis. Sure. It's the narrative of the tortured artist. There are so many people past and present who have struggled with bipolar and addiction. Um, to name a few, we have Carrie Fisher, right. um, Kurt Cobain, Robin Williams, Amy Winehouse, Marilyn Monroe, Edgar Allan Poe, Vincent Van Gogh, Beethoven, Jackson Pollock. All of these people were bipolar, are or were bipolar, and all of them had problems with addiction. Mm. And I think it's inspiring to read their stories, um, just to know that you're not alone in this illness and, and to know that you know, famous people experience it too. I, I think that's a great point. Um, and it goes back to what we were talking about earlier, that there are so many people that live with mental illness that do have um, creative, successful, fulfilling, and meaningful lives. So all those people that you listed, certainly um, we know, and we know their work. I have a feature on my blog, uh, thebipolaraddict.com, and um, it's a feature called Bipolar Geniuses. and mm -hmm. I have written profiles of all of those people that I've just mentioned, uh, examining how bipolar manifested in, in their careers and what their addictions look like. And um, that those are always some of the most popular entries in my blog. That's great. It's bipolaraddict.com and anyone can go there if they are um, interested in reading those profiles. So thank you for that. Um, before we go, is there anything else you'd like to share with us or talk about um, or enlighten people that are listening, people that live with a dual diagnosis and or those people that support them? Well, um, I always sign my books with this, Keep Hope Alive. Fantastic. That, that's a hard work sometimes and a great reminder. Um, speaking of your book, this is um, Connor's book. And tell us where the uh, people can order this if they're interested. You can order The Bipolar Addict on Amazon.com. It's also available if you live in Chicago at a few bookstores. And uh, it will soon be available, I believe, on BarnesandNoble.com as well. Not yet, but soon coming soon. All right. Thank you so much. And um, again, I really appreciate you sharing a little bit about a book. Um, definitely your story and the things that make you who you are. We appreciate that and um, continue living well. Thank you. It was great to be here.